We're down here on uh, uh, just past Georgia View Road. Uh, the fire spread rapidly in the last three hours. Uh, we're retreating from this area, moving down to protect houses on Georgia View Road. It was a very strange, weird feeling because you realize how fragile and tiny this island is. We have to get the people out and uh, we have to get them out right away. It's kind of surreal and very difficult to kind of comprehend, like, what is going on? It was freaky, and I keep saying that because it's the only way to describe the unknown and the, uh, the unrest. It was intense. There was, there was vortexes of fire flying around. Like, if you can imagine a tornado of fire that's not attached to anything at all, just flying through the air from one group of trees to another. Fire's like an animal. It eats, it breathes, it sleeps, and it fucking thinks. And this one definitely lived up to all those. Engine two, attack one. Attack one about. Yeah, Dave, we're gonna pull back. Uh, the island inferno forcing here. people to leave their homes. basically started uh, in a pile of, it appeared a pile of stumps or something of that nature that were in a gravel pit area. And from there it went up a hill and then once it got on the ridge it just took off right along the top of the ridge. We got the call at 5 o'clock uh, in the evening and uh, we went and assessed it. it. took us seven minutes to get there. We assessed it uh, by 1724, which is 524. Um, we call for air support and the Forest Service to support us. And they were there within 18 minutes, which I thought was just unbelievable. And uh, so from there, we, uh, we had high winds, so it uh, pushed the fire uh, up over a ridge, and by midnight, uh, we had about 30 acres burning. It was very windy that night, or evening, and uh, the wind basically fanned the fire right up the, uh, right up the ridge and then blew it along the ridge and it started coming over top and down onto the uh, Sticks Allison Georgia View area. Now once it hit the ridge, that's when the fire department called in the forestry with the uh, water bombers. The conditions were perfect, a warm wind, a dry forest and a spark and tonight a large portion of Galliano Island is on fire. What's the situation up here? I'd say it's pretty hopeless tonight. Doing the best we can. Yeah. Uh, as far as we were concerned, we had uh, 18 people we had on the fire line at the very beginning of the fire. Uh, we got support from um, it's, uh, North Galliano with four men there. Plus another 43 forest workers were brought in. The forest firefighters were brought in by barge and uh, they were basically in the bush along with the water bombers doing the, uh, doing the fighting of the fire. Iverson came over and then after that on the Monday firestorm came over to protect the houses that were up on Georgia View that could be hit by the fire. They set up their, uh, their sprinkler systems on these houses. Of the fire. First thing in the morning, a helicopter flies the area and checks for hot spots with an infrared camera. Once they find a hot spot, they mark it on a GPS, a global positioning system. That information is transferred to the ground crew, these uh, mop up crew, and they go in with their uh, firefighting equipment to the GPS location find the hot spot and basically kill it. You know, when, I, when I'm standing there, my numbers all match. I know I'm on top of the hot spot. 
And so uh, that's that's how we're using this. And I mark them as waypoints on my GPS as well. So once all said and done, I can go back over it and I can check to make sure that we've hit all the spots that are on the IR scan. Engine two, attack one. Attack one, hold. Yeah, Dave, we're gonna pull back. Uh, see, can you send some hose handlers up here to help us pull this hose back? We're gonna pull back. Hey. Evacuation notice was sent out about 10.30, 11 o'clock on Sunday night. Confusion like everybody else, um, but uh, it occurred to me that there might be a need for accommodation when I heard there was an evacuation. There was a woman and she had two children she's visiting from Philadelphia and she said, you know, she just kept sitting and I could see she was very nervous as all this chaos was happening in here. And she said, you don't mind if we stay, do you? And I was like, no, if you're comfortable here, stay. But, you know, anyone that was an evacuee was supposed to uh, sign in over at the evacuee center. So we were sending evacuees. And but ended up that that lady and her children, Monica, uh, they ended up sleeping on our pink couches here. And it was quite sweet in the morning. Glenda opens the restaurant. And here's these mother and children sleeping here and there were people just like literally all through the building and all downstairs in the apartment. My concern uh, primarily was for um, uh, helping residents move and also uh, helping to relocate animals if, if there was a need to do that. You could see firsthand how distraught people were. They were very frightened um, about losing their property or uh, they couldn't find their cat. Uh, you know, uh, things like that. But ultimately, I uh, was put in charge of um, getting all the accommodation together um, and putting firefighters and uh, evacuees into the accommodation. Um, fortunately, I had about eight volunteers that jumped in and they really made the whole thing happen. They're unbelievable. Within a matter of, what, six hours, we went from 40 beds to more than 200. And these are residents who live here full time and some who live in as far away as Texas, uh, opening up their homes, feeding people. For me, I have a fairly big uh, responsibility. My business is open at 7 a.m., seven days a week, and often till quite late in the evening. And I've always had that feeling that if there was an emergency or an earthquake or a fire, that this would be a place that people would naturally come to, even though that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to your designated area, but just naturally when people are in shock or frightened, they go to a place they're comfortable with. I realized a lot of time had passed, they hadn't eaten, that food was going to be a necessity. So the things that we did here at Grand Central was we, we had just people offered their help and we started making a, a sandwich line and I, we did, you know, we did like 80 sandwiches and we ran them up first and we took that to the main place. I think we took, didn't we take about 80 cheeseburgers at two in the morning? That was the next round of food. And it was quite overwhelming as we drove into the smoke and you know, everything was blocked, but they were letting us through because they could see we were bringing supplies. Grand Central's been, have, been having us come in early for breakfast. Um, I mean, all of, all of your guys' employees that have been catering to us is just, is just unbelievable because stuff like this just doesn't happen in very many other communities. It's a, an unfortunate circumstance that, that occurred. However, it was a, it was a real blessing for me in, in, in some respects. I'm a newcomer to the island. I've only been here about a year. It's really the first time that I've actually felt like I was part of the community. And so on a personal level, it's really uh, packed a punch in a positive way. So, you know, I've seen um, enough good uh, from the island to really reinforce my decision to stay here and uh, and live out my days here maybe. I think it definitely has brought people together and it, it, it was totally beautiful in seeing you know how many people skilled and unskilled or whatever wanted to do something. We had more homes that were offered for these evacuees than we had evacuees to fill them. So uh, it the island just came together and, and, uh, and uh, everybody worked together and there was no question about it. Everything seemed seamless. It just unfolded in front of me. And, and so all of the people that were there that were helping out, volunteers, uh, they did an absolutely marvelous job of, of getting this thing, uh, get the emergency evacuation rolling. The work effort that went into this was just phenomenal. Just basically we have to do this, this and this and it was done and there was no question about it. Uh, like I say, the, the island responded miraculously. It was, it was something else. The word is awesome, uh, you know, but that's such a 
a bad word because everybody uses the word awesome, but it's just something that uh, I just couldn't believe how, like I say, it was so seamless and so many different people that uh, coordinated this effort, you know, and, and they're going to be unsung heroes and and that's the way it's got to be because you just don't know all of the people, all the participants in, in mobilizing and getting all of the people together. And they're just going to be the unsung heroes. I have seen how quickly all the politics and daily battles that people have with one another can melt away um, when faced with something that's serious or threatening. It's just incredible. Your lungs hurt and you could only imagine what kind of you know, damage or risk people were putting themselves at, at to try to save this island. So it was just uh, very humbling and very just overwhelming, the feeling of appreciation that I have for the people who did that. It's our island and we're looking after it and we're looking after the people that live here. What a great community I live in. I really, that, that's all I want to say about it. It's just like, boy, Galliano, you rock. It was an unfortunate blessing because we survived it and we made it through and it brought people together and that's what all communities should hope for in the event of some kind of disaster, that they get through it without any harm, without any loss and that you're brought together closer and you count your blessings.